All right, you guys, it's Ross. I thought I would talk to you guys today about some things that are in my yard that I would recommend that you guys plant. You know, it is the spring. Um, every year, I like to give you guys some good recommendations on what I like to grow and the reasons why. We've done really lots of individual videos on all the different fruits that you can grow in a temperate climate. And um, this is kind of like a, a compilation in a sense of, of that. And maybe just, um, if you're thinking about, maybe you have a spot in your yard, you're thinking about growing something, um, this could definitely help. So the first thing I would recommend that you guys grow, really, as you guys know, is I love figs, okay? That's what's underneath all these tunnels here. And they are my favorite. Um, at least my favorite to grow and one of my favorites to eat. And we talk a lot about figs, so I'm not going to go into too much detail with this, but you absolutely should have a fig tree. I mean, it, and you should really pay attention to the variety. I would just say in general, a great recommendation is either Smith, Hardy Chicago, Villette de Bordeaux, Celeste. Those are really easy to find and they'll do well in pretty much any climate. Now, the next thing I really like is the persimmon. And this is actually my actual favorite. This is even above and beyond the figs. And I think the reason for that is because first off, they taste amazing. Um, I've talked about the flavor. I've done a lot of persimmon videos now with you guys. This one in particular is called Proc. Proc is an American persimmon that has a really awesome dried fruit flavor. So it has a very, uh, you know, a date-like flavor that's very strong, like rum raisin, has a raisin-like flavor, has a flavor that you would find in a really well-aged red wine. As it gets older, the raisin flavor starts to come out, the date-like flavors start to come out. It's all very similar in that sense. Figs, dried figs have a very similar flavor. Even uh, some fresh varieties like Little Ruby have this flavor. And for me, it's so present in this particular variety, more than any of the other ones I've tried so far. Uh, I think Neater is another one that I'm gonna eventually get my hands on to try. But this one for me, it's got a great exquisite flavor. It's soft, it's an astringent persimmon, so you get to wait, but it ripens among the earliest. So this will, this will do really well for a lot of people. Uh, I find that the earlier they ripen before frost, the better the quality will be. So this is just a super high quality persimmon with a really good flavor. And um, for me, it's just hard to beat. This one is, uh, you know, probably my favorite at this current moment. It's called Proc. And also you could grow it pretty much anywhere. You know, the fig, you got to protect it in certain, certain locations, zone sevens and lower. This proc goes all the way down to, I think at least zone five and maybe even some zone fours. Do your research. While we're over here, I do want to mention, uh, we do have some elderberry. So there are some things that are brand new. We planted really only a year or two ago. We have them under, underneath this big giant black cherry tree. Not a ton of sun, not a ton of attention I give these things, but they're getting going. Given the right amount, the good, a good soil, these things will really go. So, you know, as an example, this particular honeyberry variety back there, don't know too much about it. This particular elderberry or elderberries in general, can't really give a great opinion on it. But the majority of the fruits that you can grow here and people generally appreciate, I've grown them all. And I would also recommend as we keep going further is that this is a gooseberry. This thorny thing is just a bit difficult to maneuver around. Um, so I would probably put this in a place that doesn't need a lot of light actually. Um, underneath a tree over here where you don't really need to go, that's a great place for it. Uh, somewhere that you don't travel much. Like this is where I travel, right? I kind of use this as a path and get into, into this section here of the food forest. And I would just say that <laughs> you probably want to plant it somewhere that doesn't need a lot of light and there's not a lot of traffic. They do exceptionally well here and they will do exceptionally well for you. I, I would 
probably venture to guess that these things would do well almost anywhere. Uh, of course, you need to have a good soil and you want to have good mulch, good organic material in your soil. Assuming you got that, it's going to do well. Um, I know that they can be kind of disease prone in particular places, but this thing is problem free. Um, the only thing that bothers it is the birds. And to me, it's a very early to ripen grape. That's fantastic. This one's called Hinomaki Red. There's some others that uh, people have recommended like uh, Hinomaki Yellow. Uh, they're extremely cheap, easy to find. The coolest thing about them is that you could take a cutting off, just a branch. I wonder if I could even do this now as they've just leafed out like this. I could certainly do it with the, the gooseberry here. I think it's just now leafing out. And if I wanted to clone this, propagate it somewhere else, I could just stick that right in the ground. I'd have no issue with this thing actually propagating. They're so easy to propagate. Now the friend or the cousin of the gooseberry is actually this one here. It's called the Yosta berry or Josta berry or whatever you want to pronounce it. This thing is a cross between a currant and the gooseberry. I would highly recommend these as well. This is something that was rather new to me last year. They're obviously plants, especially this one over here. They've gotten some good size to them now. I have two different varieties of Yostaberry. I think one's a black and one is a red. They both are exceptional and uh, I would highly, highly, highly recommend them. Uh, they're actually, my cousin came here, tried a number of the fruits and that was his favorite, especially if you're somebody who likes something tart, acidic, complex, he was just in love with that. Um, I'd also venture to recommend these pawpaw trees. And this is uh, the sixth or seventh, I don't even know, I've lost count at this point, how many years it's been that I've planted, since I've planted these trees. You gotta put them in full sun. So, you know, there, there's a lot of just bad information out there they really do like to be in full sun. And if I had planted them in full sun in a better spot, they would have produced a lot earlier. But now the flowers are coming. This is the sixth or seventh season. And there are these round buds all over the branches now. And these trees will be covered in fruits this season, which is fantastic because I've had the fruits from other people's trees and they are seriously a very, very good fruit. Uh, the most tropical fruit you can grow in a temperate place. So for me, my money's there. It's like a banana custard that can be a little bit bitter. It's very sweet. The texture is amazing. And you know what? You can't get them in a store. You can't get them anywhere. Uh, in fact, if you were to have them in a product or even see them at the store, they would go bad very, very quickly. And they even go bad in the, in the freezer. So you have to kind of take them while you can get them. Uh, the other thing I'd recommend here is this plant. This is probably my, behind figs and persimmons, this is probably the one I recommend the most, which is called the Gumi. This one is such an amazing plant. I don't really have words. I've, I've done a number of videos now. And people are really starting to catch on with this thing. Um, I only have one variety. I wish I had other varieties that were of a larger size, like this one here is called Carmine. I think it goes by other names. Uh, Tillamook, I think, is another name for it, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you can find this thing at Burnt Ridge Nursery. You can find it at uh, One Green World. Um, hopefully, I'm going to be selling some plants of this, probably uh, maybe this fall. I don't, I don't necessarily know. My plan was actually to propagate this, but it's already leafed out and I don't want to cut it now that it's leafed out um, and try and propagate it. Uh, I probably, I imagine my propagation success would not be very good. Uh, in any case, this is just, for me, it has everything. It produces a super amount of fruit. It's one of the earliest fruits to produce. The fruits taste amazing. This is a totally problem-free plant. And I mean, it's even super problem free because it fixes its own nitrogen. You don't have to really even care for this damn thing. Uh, it doesn't get very big, as you can see. I mean, it's probably six feet tall by six feet wide or so. And 
You can even contain it even further. Uh, it really isn't that difficult. There are these long water shoots that come up and you can cut those out every year and it, it could be very easily a six by six bush permanently. Um, it, the foliage is beautiful, the fruits are beautiful, uh, it produces a ridiculous amount of fruits and the fruits are of a large size. Uh, whereas some of the other varieties of Gumi that you may find like Red Gem and Sweet Scarlet, they're extremely small uh, and are not really worth growing in my opinion. Um, so this one, it just changes the game in terms of Gumi. Maybe you've grew it in the past. Uh, the flavor is outrageously good. I think a lot of people would enjoy it. And they are very much so like a gummy bear that you can grow at home. It's just really that ridiculous. Some of the other things I'd grow as we keep going throughout this section of the yard is I would definitely obviously grow some apples, some pears, some stone fruits. You know, I think there are definitely some varietal recommendations within those. You know, I really like the uh, Indian free or the Indian blood peaches that you can grow. I like the Red Haven peach. I love the uh, different varieties of stone fruits that I've mentioned in the past. Like, you know, Green Gage is one that's highly recommended. Also would recommend uh, uh, early blush apricot. But you know, for something that's a little different, you know, I'm assuming you guys would be more interested in something that's a little bit different. Along the back fence here, which really doesn't get a lot of light, although the sun's shining now, these are um, muscadine grapes. And these guys produce a ton of fruit. They will produce a ton of fruit this year. I am shocked to see how much fruit they actually put out, how problem free they are, because straight ahead against the fence, as you can see here, is a is an actual grapevine that's got European and American genes in it. Um, that's very different than the muscadine grape. That's the typical grape that we see in stores. They're seedless table grapes, and those are just way more difficult. To I would argue definitely tastier fruits, but way more difficult and much more problems that you'll see on those particular fruits, but it's doable. Here, even here in a very disease heavy place, these grapes, uh, in a more traditional sense, these grapes can definitely be grown at a very high quality. And I would highly, 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 highly recommend you grow them. So even though I'm saying that uh, I like this muscadine grape along the back, I would recommend growing both. But Certainly, I think if I had to choose one, it probably would definitely be this Mars. It's very, very good. Uh, it's it's kind of like a Concord-esque uh, grape that doesn't have a seed in it. And they produce extremely high quality fruit. And it's a very productive vine. Now, this thing here is getting quite large. This is probably very similar to the pawpaw. I planted this a long time ago. And this thing is, um, it's called a honeyberry. So this is probably, I would imagine, probably it's fifth season. Not the sunniest location. Um, we've worked on the soil many times over, over the years. So it's got a great soil in this spot, but uh, the, you know, the sun just doesn't shine much here and it gets shaded out. But considering all that, it produces quite a bit of fruit. This now is fifth season. It's gonna produce a ton of fruit. I can't wait to show of you guys, show all of you guys how much fruit it will produce. Um, because that's been one of the things with honeyberries that I think a lot of people uh, are, are a bit wary of. You know, there are some people are concerned. That's one of their main concerns, let's say, when it comes to the honeyberry, is that is it really gonna produce as much fruit as they say? Uh, the answer is, I think, yes because I got a really good glimpse of this plant last year and the production on it. But um, it takes a long time, I think, guys, for these honeyberries to kind of get established. You want them in a lot of sun, I find, um, and you want them in a um, very good soil with a lot of organic material. You know, this back area here is kind of like a food forest. We've planted so many layers of mulch over the years. I've chopped and dropped comfrey. I've chopped all of my prunings back in here. The soil has been greatly improved. And this plant in particular loves that. So 
you need to give it a good soil and it, it'll speed up that process of getting established and uh, producing a lot of fruit. So we'll see what, what it does this year in terms of production. But for me, actually, it's one of my favorite berries now. It's definitely one of my favorite fruits. Uh, you have to learn how to pick them. You have to learn when they're actually ripe. They'll turn blue. Uh, and then they'll expand to a much larger size after they turn blue. And believe it or not, then they're actually ready. Uh, once you can kind of see that the, uh, you can kind of feel them and they're a bit soft on the bush. They, they may even fall off the bush. And that's really when you know when they're ready. You, there's multiple uh, sections within the fruit that have to kind of ripen uh, one after another or kind of at the same time. And uh, until those internal parts of the fruit are ripe, the, extern the external part of the fruit may look like it's ripe, but the internal part is not. So you have to really wait for that full flavor. I mean, how can you judge a fruit when it's not fully ripe? It just doesn't make any sense. So for me, I've, I've learned they're actually quite uh, sweet. They are extremely complex. Uh, one of my favorites for sure. Right in here is a little uh, strawberry coffin that I've created. This is the variety called Mara de Bois. Highly, highly recommend it, this variety. I've been preaching about it for a long time. A lot of people have come back to me and said, Ross, thank you for recommending that particular variety. Uh, it's true. It really is one of the best. Um, there are probably other better strawberries, but it's so soft that they just melt in your mouth. They're so good. Here's a Salavatsky pomegranate, by the way. It's really getting established. I cut off a lot of the lower growth because... I needed to make some space for the figs below, but hopefully this thing will produce and I'll be able to really recommend that particular variety in this climate. And then if we go back over, it's actually the, uh, the north side of the property. Actually, this is the east side of the property, excuse me. This is where the sun um, rises. And I have other things over here like blueberries and persimmons um, I even have mulberries so this mulberry back here if you guys can see that this well I'll bring you guys in in a second but uh, this Girardi mulberry gets about six by six you can already see that it's getting about uh, about two and a half by two and a half but as it matures it will not become a very large mulberry which is really I think the struggle with mulberries uh, that I've found they just get too damn big. They're hard to control, and the way that they fruit is on last year's growth, so uh, the buds from last year. So if you were to chop off all the buds from last year, you wouldn't get any fruit. And that's the problem. You can't really chop it back really hard and expect a good crop. So that's kind of the key, and why this mulberry is so special is that it's, it's really a dwarf. It doesn't grow very much, doesn't grow very tall and it'll still produce a lot of fruit. The density of the fruit is much higher on the smaller bush. I have another one there that I've grafted that's getting established. And uh, I will be grafting much more because these mulberry seedlings, they just pop up all over the place. Here's more honeyberries. And again, they're leafing out and they're gonna flower very soon. The blueberries, you gotta have a very specific soil, but they are very rewarding and they're extremely good. I think my favorite variety is this one over here. Uh, which one is it? I think it's this one. Uh, let me just see the tag here, figure out. Is it Elliot? Oh man, it could be this guy. No, 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 no. It's this guy over here behind me, which is Drapper. That's it. So this blueberry, although very small in size, there's a Chippewa right next to it, which also produces very high quality fruit, but the Drapper is uh, above and beyond all of them. And I'm a huge fan of that particular, of that particular fruit. Um, I will mention, because we're gonna pass the cherries here in a minute. There are the traditional cherries that are I forget, I think they're called Prunus serotina is the, uh, 
the name for them, but these are the traditional cherries that you guys would see in the store, and I would recommend them, but there's another form called a bush cherry that you may have heard of, and the bush cherry is a bit different, uh, very similar in terms of the fruits, but different species of plant. And I haven't really gotten a full grasp of that cherry to say if I would highly, highly recommend them or not. Um, so we're kind of waiting to evaluate the cherries a bit further, just in general as uh, both types. Now the apricot, early blush, you gotta do it. I, I loved it so much that I grafted myself another one, which is right here. It's getting itself established. And you know what, I'll get to taste this fruit again this Tomcot is gonna to produce a ton of fruit. Look at all them flowers on this thing. I do have to thin it out, I imagine I will this year. What I would recommend is this green gauge plum. It has not leafed out yet. The other ones here, the Pluots, some of the other plums I have planted, the Santa Rosa, the Japanese types, they're all leafing out, they're all flowering, and it is just too early in the season. So a late frost could come in and wipe these out. These Italian prune plums and the green gauge are just a bit slower to do that. So that's a nice little bonus that they're very, not only are they very tasty, but they have a nice benefit of flowering a bit later. Here's my collection of raspberries and blackberries that we're gonna talk about. The black raspberry, I think it's called Jewel. I have it planted here. You can see I have them kind of trellised up with just with stakes for the current moment. They're easy to grow. They propagate very easily. I've planted a number of them now in different areas of the yard because the black raspberry is my favorite. We've got the yellow raspberry, the pink raspberry, the red raspberry, and the purple raspberry. The black is by far the best one. And I imagine probably even the most nutritious. Over here in this section of the yard, we have the Marionberry, and I have them kind of buried amongst uh, these leaves that we have. But this one here actually is along the ground, and some of them have died back, but this is by far, would definitely recommend this one. This is uh, my favorite berry, I believe. This one's above and up there in a similar class but I think better than the black raspberry, the gumi, which I think we can call a berry, right? Um, there's the black raspberry, there's the honeyberry, there's the yostaberry, um, and there's the gooseberry. I, and you maybe put the strawberries up there, of course, as well. This one is just, I think, the best. This vine, very thorny. It is a, a plant that Gets a lot of praise in, I think, Oregon and the Pacific Northwest, probably Washington State. Super thorny. So you got to be, yep, I just got myself. You got to be real careful with this thing. You should be wearing gloves if you're going to handle it because I just got myself a couple splinters. <laughs> so... You know, it's, it's in that sense, it's the one downfall. I don't like that about these plants. Some of the thorns are really annoying. Uh, I remember when I grew thorned blackberries and I made a switch to some thornless varieties. What a difference that was. I mean, holy crap. Uh, this is just generally extremely annoying. And uh, hopefully in the future, this will be bred out of this particular variety. I would really love to see that uh, because these produce a blackberry that is way better than any other blackberry and uh, they kind of taste like you have um, you know the flavor of a raspberry if you took that and you multiplied it by like two or three or four and then injected it into a blackberry that's what it feels like you're eating is that the, it's the shape the mouthfeel the experience of eating a blackberry but it really does taste a lot like a raspberry, and it's, it's incredible. Um, it's a flavor unlike any other, I think, you've really experienced with most of these fruits. So for me, I think it's a must grow. Uh, you know, I wish the plants were a bit more established as those died and it was covering this whole trellis. 
So I don't know what's going on with that, why that croaked in the middle of the summer last year. But uh, that's, maybe it's something to do with, uh, I don't know, something that happened. But, you know, the point is, is that these are some of the best berries. And in the future, uh, I would love to have uh, a huge row of this or have them scattered in different places uh, because they're just to die for. Uh, again, seriously, my favorite berry. Here's more persimmons. We got more figs back in here. The pears are over here to my right. And then there's the raspberry patch. Um, you know, I just do, I really do think that the black raspberry and this Marion berry, they're just top tier. Seriously, you got to try them. Um, it's really hard to beat. I know that everyone's like, oh, I've grown raspberries before, but you haven't tasted a black raspberry. I promise. If you've never had one, it's amazing. Um, oh, by the way. This is something a bit unusual. These are pears, and you know what? These are some really high quality pears. I didn't realize that Harrow Sweet was gonna be so good. It's a European type. Uh, but this Asian persimmon here, it's called, uh, is this one Chajoro? Let me just make sure. Yeah, this is Chajoro. This is an incredibly good uh, pear, and it's an Asian type that's different than the rest. A lot of people are not really familiar with it. I don't know if other varieties are going to be just as good as that, but I swear to you, it has some really intense flavor to it. Um, and for me, it's it's such a productive, precocious tree, you know? Uh, maybe that wouldn't be the case if I planted many more of them, but I find that they're good producers, even young. And then we go to the front, which we're pretty much done here at this point. But again, we've got more persimmons. We got the jujubes here. This was a whole row of figs. That's another Concord style grape there along the house that we have pruned low, trained low. Um, I have a citrus tree there. And the peaches, the nectarines, and then this beautiful Rosianca persimmon. But it kind of ends the tour. I mean, it's kind of it was like a tour, but also telling you guys, hey, this is what we should grow, what you should grow or think about growing. It is still the spring. It is still the time to be planning this stuff. Why not? You have space. You want to grow something different. You want to try something new. We just talked about in a video that I did about having genetic diversity and, reason, and the reasons why that's so important now that we're in the spring these warmer temperatures we've been having, we could get some late frost on those apricots that we just looked at. But the garden is loving it. The garden's loving these warmer temperatures. So it's good to have diversity. One thing happens weather-wise that's not good at one point of the season. Well, later on, the weather is going to be good. So it's good to have fruits that ripen at different times, not just different varieties within themselves that ripen at different times, uh, but even... Uh, different species that ripen at totally different times. So plant something new, you'd be really surprised, I think. And uh, it's good for you too. We'll see you guys soon. Take care.